Hey, what's going on, gang? Nate on the Stone here. Welcome back to my channel and to the 84th edition of The Rolling Stone. I hope that you all had a very, very Merry Christmas. Hope that um, it was joyful and joyous and that um, you were all filled with the peace of uh, the newborn king, which is, um, I mean, what what the day is all about when we get right down to brass tacks. Um, but we are loaded as we always are, so we are going to dive head first into this. This first story, it, like so many stories anymore, there is so much going on behind the title that we really have to kind of dig down into it. This story is from Politico, and it was published, um, let's see, just, just about almost a week ago, actually, December 20th. Headline, Biden Space Advisors Urge Cooperation with China. Lawmakers are skeptical of any cooperation and have made it difficult to join forces with China in space. So, of course, right off the bat, the, the, the question that is right on the surface is, what, what, why would the United States, why would it be in our interests to actually ally ourselves with our biggest competitor and the nation that actually wants to be the world's lone superpower. Because I mean, that is the end goal for China. China wants to be the superpower. It believes in its national mythology. It believes that China was the center of the world until the aberration happened and the West kind of took over. And then especially the, the Anglo world of which America is a part. And so, and then of course, after World War II, America has been the lone superpower. We were the last man standing, and we seem to have proven that in 1989 with the collapse of the USSR, which was actually more of a third world country that was acting as a first world country simply because it had nuclear weapons, because it had stolen the technology for nuclear weapons through the atomic spy ring that was operating in Washington, D.C. and other places in the United States. So China sees the China sees the, um, how do I want to say it? China sees itself becoming the top dog as just a, it, it's history aligning itself correctly again. This is the Great Reset. This is everything returning to normal, where everyone orbits around China. So the, the, the obvious question is why? Would we ally, ourse ally ourselves with a country like that, especially with something that is as vital to national security and a whole host of other fields as space exploration? And uh, surprisingly, the political speech, act, uh, the, the political piece, actually kind of makes that point. They, Biden's advisors, assert that despite China's pattern of stealing American technology and diverting it for military purposes, a limited space partnership between Washington and Beijing could reduce tensions and the likelihood of a destabilizing space race. The debate gained more urgency recently after China became the third nation to retrieve samples from the moon, the latest in a series of major achievements for its ambitious space program. Trying to exclude them, I think, is a failing strategy. Pam Melroy, a former astronaut who is serving on Biden's NASA transition team and is among those being considered to lead the space agency, told Politico before the election, it's very important that we engage. Most of the nearly two dozen former astronauts, government officials, and space experts interviewed by Politico agreed that, American, that America could lose its position as the global space leader if it shuts Beijing out entirely. My concern is not that China is going places, but that our partners are going to China, said former NASA administrator and astronaut Charles Bolden, who endorsed Biden and worked with him in the Obama administration. We seem to be satisfied to follow them, to allow them to go off and build their own space station. That's short-sighted. It's not the mark of a good leader. So there we have it. There we have it. Even though China 
steals our stuff, steals our technology. And even though they have mo hundreds and hundreds of honeypot agents running around the country. Remember Fang Fang, whom Eric Swal who Eric Swalwell, <laughs> Eric Swalwell was uh, bumping into repeatedly. <clears throat> Make of that what you will. Um, Remember, we talked about this in the video that I made this past spring about the war with China, where China actually put malware on electronic pieces that it then sold to American companies. Malware, not software, malware that gave them access to uh, companies with defense contracts, banks, businesses, government agencies, the whole works. It gave them, it gave China a back door into our secrets. But no, 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 no. Being a good leader means embracing them with open arms. Now, there is something to be said about, well, keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer. But that has become, that's become nothing more than a cliche game because there is no opposition to China. Do you think that China Joe is actually going to do anything about China? He's not gonna do a damn thing about China. When the, Wash when the New York Post broke the story about the Hunter Biden laptop, a story that has now conveniently disappeared, by the by, we found out that Hunter Biden was in the pocket of China. And as Mark Stein has continuously pointed out on his podcast, what we know about the Biden's connections with China is great. I mean, there's a ton of stuff now that we know people who were actually interested enough in the story to look into it. So what do you think the Chinese have on the Bidens? The Bidens, Joe Biden, he's not going to touch Beijing with a 50-foot pole that's held by all of his lackeys because, of course, he's too frail and weak to actually hold it up himself. So if we actually do this, if America actually welcomes China with open arms, it's going to be China running the show. We are going to be the junior partner to China. Now, th this is where we get into the subtext of this story, because I think that it is fascinating. And there is a, there are two implied stories here, or, or two implied lessons here. The first one deals with uh, political philosophy. Do you remember when states like Illinois and New York and California, when they were forbidding state travel to uh, states like Louisiana and Georgia, by which I mean they were forbidding state government workers from traveling there on the state's payroll. So if you worked for the state government of California and you felt like you needed to go to Georgia for whatever reason, uh, California said, we're not going to pay it. We're not going to do anything. Why? Because states like Georgia and Louisiana, they had passed, for example, so-called bathroom bills that actually recognized biological reality and said, hey, if you're a biological guy, you go to the guy's room. If you're a biological female, you go to the girl's room, okay? It doesn't matter what you wish you were, what you want to be, what you hope to be, what you feel that you are, okay? Biology matters in our states. In our state, within our state borders, reality and biology matter. Or states like Louisiana, which simply did more to protect babies that hadn't been born yet. That was That got the same... Uh, the same treatment from California, New York, Pennsylvania, etc. No travel. We are we are not going to do that. In fact, the NBA got into it too. They said, well, we might have to rethink our priorities. We might not have games here anymore. You're going to lose a lot of revenue, blah, blah, because Hollywood was saying, we're not going to make movies here. You know, a lot of movies are actually filmed in Atlanta because the taxes are better in Atlanta than they are in anywhere in California. That's a little tip that I learned. I mean, everyone was coming down on these states for these laws. They were, these laws were said, bathroom bills, pro-life bills, they were said to be violations of human rights. These states were no better than Nazis in the Third Reich. Meanwhile, China, the country that the geniuses in the Biden administration want to get all buddy-buddy, even more buddy-buddy than we already are, 
the Chinese, the Chinese Communist state is the place where human rights go to die. We've talked about this before here on the channel. The Chinese right now are engaged in a genocide against the Uyghurs in the northwest part of their country. The Uyghurs are a minority Muslim group. Okay, so they're a minority and a Muslim. You think that the left will be all over defending them? Nope. The Chinese have actually created concentration camps. Honest to God, concentration camps, gang. That they are throwing Uyghurs into. They are torturing them. They are raping them. They're performing medical experiments on these people. Okay, the, What they are doing there, it's straight out of Nazi Germany. Straight out of it. And yet the left doesn't say anything about it. You're never going to hear LeBron James talk about the violations of human rights that are in China. You're never going to hear the global community say anything about it. I mean, hell, the UN just this past spring, I believe, put China back on the um, UN Committee on Human Rights. That is how corrupt and how puerile these people and these institutions are. Now, the interesting thing about that is, you know, bills, bathroom bills that recognize reality, pro-life bills, those are violations of human rights. But what the Chinese are doing are not human rights. Now, we could say that it's just a matter of hypocrisy, but I think it goes deeper than that. Because what this really shows is that human rights now, if you want to use that term. I know I prefer the term natural rights. That's a bit more solid than human rights, but we'll use human rights for right now because that seems to be the jargon of the day. Human rights only exist within the parameters of the left. And that is important because so much of our rhetoric revolves around rights. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed, uh, for example, uh, Jack Phillips, the baker from Colorado? When he was sued because he politely declined to make a, uh, you know, a, a quote unquote gay wedding cake, he said his defense was, well, this violates my rights. This violates my right to religious freedom and to believe what I want to believe. He didn't make a moral argument. He made an argument based on rights. And that's a lot of what the right does. That's a lot of what a, a, a lot of people on the right do. They make arguments based on rights. They make arguments based on practicality. They make rights based on uh, economic, economic arguments, utilitarian arguments. This would be practical. This would not be. And arguments based on rights. You can't do this because this would violate this person's rights or this would violate this person's rights. But when rights ultimately don't exist except within the confines that the left has created then you have a problem because then you can't use those arguments you can't use that language anymore because when you do you're simply using the language that the left has already created you're playing in their sandbox and every time you play in somebody else's sandbox you have to abide by their rules you can try to overthrow the rules you can try to try to tweak the rules you could try to get the rules to play to your advantage, but it's never going to actually work because the rules are made for their sandbox and you're in their sandbox. That's what this really shows. Rights now no longer exist except within the parameters that the left already sets up, which means that if you oppose them and you divorce yourself from the left, then you have no human rights. It's very fascinating to see that this implied mindset makes us much closer to China than anyone would like to admit. Ah, but maybe you're saying that you don't want to get into the political philosophy of it all. Well, there's a practical argument to be made here too, gang. A practical lesson, which is the burden of empire is a heavy one. And unless you have civilizational confidence you are going to give that empire away. That is what's happening. All these people can say that, oh, letting China into our space program, working together with them, that's the sign of a good leader. That's the sign of a strong leader. No, it's not. No, it's not. Real, real leadership would be crushing the bastards in Beijing, like Chairman Xi, throwing him 
into some sort of prison for the rest of his life, him and all of his cronies. That would be real leadership. Real leadership would be completely destroying the apparatus of the Chinese communist state, like Reagan did with the USSR. That would be real leadership. This is not. This is the abdication of empire. I made this argument actually at the beginning of the year. It's been almost a year ago, which is kind of scary to think about. But my very first video of 2020, you might remember, and I'll link it here at the end so that you can watch it again if you want, was that um, empire. That America is an empire, whether we like it or not. We are the center, or we were the center, of power and learning and art and culture. From you know, modern times, we'll say 2020, unt, uh, from 1945, the end of World War II, 1945 to the present. But that requires a lot of responsibility. That requires a lot of guts and brass. And most importantly, that requires civilizational confidence. When you don't have civilizational confidence, then you can't have your empire because then you don't feel like you're worthy of empire. And then if you don't feel like you're worthy of empire, well, why would you even bother? It's much easier, much better to force people to accept the idea that men can go into the girls' rooms and that women should be able to abort their babies at whatever stage of the pregnancy they want if they simply want to abort them than to actually be the reigning power of the earth. To be an example for the other nations, to help other nations when um, uh, factors dictate that you should. And by keeping peace and order. Working with others for the peace and order of the world. It is trading in the really important things in the sense of global politics, global order, simply to play bully in your own backyard. Because there are... Rural people, Trump voters who don't think that a man can become a woman who then can become a dragon. And it's much more important to force them to live lies than to actually lead the rest of the world in order, justice, and freedom. That's what's going on here. This is the willful transmission of empire from the U.S. to China. And that is going to be a scary thing because you look at what the Chinese state is doing. I talked about the Uyghurs. You look at also what they're doing with um, facial, rec uh, facial recognition technology, the apparatus of the spy state, um, the social credit system that the Chinese have, uh, the genetic experiments that they're doing. People are simply means to an end. They are cogs in the machine of the state. You look at that and you ask yourself if you really want China to be the empire of the world. And if the answer is no, then we better be busting our backs. Keeping a PG here. Busting our backs to make sure that, that, that we do everything in our power to make sure that that doesn't happen. That is story number one.